Our speaker now before our lunch, <laughs> so I'll keep us on track, is Alex Urban. Uh, he is an assistant professor in the Department of Psychiatry and also an assistant professor appointed in the Department of Genetics at Stanford. Uh, he's interested in uh, genome analysis technology to understand the genetic and epigenetic basis of brain development and brain function. Thank you. Yes, yes thank you, Laura. Uh, thank you, Laura. Uh, so yes, so I'm, uh, my primary appointment is in psychiatry, as Laura mentioned, then I have a secondary appointment in genetics, and the lab is actually in the, in the genome center, physically located in the genome center, and, and the, uh, the reason for this arrangement is that, is that psychiatric disorders are really to a large extent um, uh, uh, genetic disorders. Uh, you can see here some of the major uh, psychiatric conditions and high or even very high degrees of heritability. However, there are also complex genetic disorders, meaning um, they're not caused by a single gene or a single mutation in a single gene that then leads to the disease manifesting, but rather what we have to deal with uh, uh, is uh, a situation where we have multiple variants in multiple locations of the, uh, in many genes uh, across the genome uh, coming together to form a predisposition for these conditions and then in interaction with the environment uh, the disease manifests. And in order to, um, to uh, f uh, be able to produce a complete uh, genetic molecular genetic blueprint of, of psychiatric conditions, what we need to bring to bear is advanced genome technology. And luckily, these uh, advanced genome technologies, these are really exciting times. As a geneticist uh, and a psychiatric geneticist, these are really exciting times because we're in the midst um, of an unfolding genome technology revolution uh, illustrated here. What, what is plotted here is the cost of sequencing a single human genome. And if you wanted to do that in 2001, right after the first human genome was completed, uh, you would have to uh, have paid $100 million for a single human genome, and it would have taken well over a year. And now today, we are down here where we sequence uh, genomes for $850, and our instruments run 16 genomes at a time, and it runs about a week. And the same instruments we also use to uh, do uh, readouts of genome acti uh, gen gene activity, uh, activity patterns, and of epigenetic marks, uh, DNA methylation and such, which genes are on and off in a given tissue versus the other. Uh, uh, a large uh, psychiatric genetic and genomics consortia have been formed, international consortia that use a spin-off technology, DNA uh, uh, microchips, um, to, uh, to interrogate the DNA samples from tens and now hundreds of thousands of psychiatric patients versus controls. And as a result, we now have multiple good uh, genetic candidate loci for, for, for many of these conditions, and the lists are being expanded as we speak, even larger cohorts. Uh, when we look, here's just an example for one such locus, uh, this on chromosome 10, this region here, and you see that these are all the, the markers on the DNA chip, and this region here uh, rises above significance. So something is different in many schizophrenia patients' genomes in that region, but we don't know exactly what at this point. So you can see there is, these are the genes here, and in that region alone there is uh, four, five, six genes, depending on how you count. But we can start dissecting this now, um, or putting it together, depending on how you look at it. Uh, because many of these candidate genes we already know, um, uh, the, the functions coming out of, for example, here, the, uh, some of the important proteins that make up a synapse. And when we just take the uh, genes coming from the screens and feed them into known functions, categories come up such as synapse function, brain circuit development, so that's reassuring. Um, and interestingly, also categories such as chromatin regulation, i.e. the packaging of DNA and the patterns of uh, uh, epigenetic marks along the DNA, uh, controlling uh, uh, gene activity and immune function. And so what we do in the lab in collaboration with many uh, uh, colleagues and labs here at Stanford is, uh, for example, we, uh, we use uh, some of the stem cell approaches that have been mentioned here already, uh, where we make stem cells from patients with some of these mutations. And then we turn them into neurons and glia, and we see how the mutations talk to the genetic and epigenetic networks in their natural habitat, the brain cells. Uh, and we're also working with colleagues to integrate the genetics with brain imaging and to, to create better animal models. And of course, uh, A, we want to understand the brain and its normal and abnormal states. And also uh, one, one thing to keep in mind are uh, better drug targets coming out of these lists. Uh, but there is one uh, barrier that uh, even the really advanced, compared to just a few years ago, genome technology of today cannot breach in this context. And I, I, I call these the no-go zones of the human genome. This is kind of the big, dirty, little secret of, uh, 
of human genomics, which is when we, we say, and this is actually sold uh, by the companies making these instruments as whole genome sequencing, but we're actually sequencing only about 50% of the whole genome. So these are the components, the categories of sequence inside the, in the human genome. And uh, here are the uh, protein coding genes. So good news, they're only 2% of the genome and we can sequence them. And then we get about this half here. We can, uh, we can resolve that. This entire half we're currently leaving on the table when we sequence the human genome. There are technical reasons uh, because of the short read output of the instruments, which is necessary to get the throughput. But then these are actually regions that are repetitive. And so the algorithms can't place the read, the standard algorithms. Um, and that's, uh, that's uh, really too bad because there is very good reasons to believe that essential pieces of genetic puzzle of brain function are actually inside these no-go uh, no areas. Uh, one such category are the segmental duplications here, which are very interesting. Uh, they're a feature specific for the human genome, and maybe chimpanzees and other uh, higher order primates have some. So it's a species with extended brain function and large cortex, uh, cortices um, have these segmental duplications in their genome, and they actually make the genome brittle. Uh, the genome actually likes to snap at these uh, segmental duplications there down here. And then uh, more often than not, whenever the genome snaps, we either see it in cancer or uh, something happens and usually something that's not good to brain function. Uh, yet for evolutionary, it's interesting to speculate why our uh, species has kept these in the genome. But for our intents and purposes, here's an example. Here are uh, six genome sequencing tracks, uh, three patients, uh, three controls, uh, three patients with a high risk a mutation for schizophrenia and autism. And you see here, wherever there's segment duplication, we get only this interference signal, we can't resolve it. But with advanced technology that has just been emerging in our genome center called CRISPR-Catch, which was developed for cancer, and we just have been adopting it to psychiatry, uh, we can now cut out these segmented duplications, then sequence them separately with advanced linked read sequencing, and then actually resolve them. So this is, uh, this is uh, exciting times. Um, Another, just last, uh, lastly, uh, before lunch, uh, one more no-go area of the human genome. Uh, these 20, full 20%, around 20% are made up by line elements. What are line elements? They are essentially ancient retrovirus that live in each of our genomes. Each of our genomes has about 500,000 of these line elements uh, uh, in it. And most of these 500,000 are uh, inactive. They just sit there. Um, but uh, uh, amongst them, and hiding actually amongst them, as far as our current sequencing technology is concerned, we can't resolve them with standard sequencing, are uh, in every human genome several active line ones. And what they do is they copy themselves out and then at random copy themselves in elsewhere in the genome. And that's actually a mutagenic event. And we know already this is happening in cancer, in some cancers more than in others. And there's uh, increasingly strong reasons to, uh, to uh, uh, to um, think that this is uh, uh, implicated in shaping brain function. And actually, it is also uh, 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 be uh, becoming implicated in autoimmune disorders and in aging. Um, and so again, we can develop advanced genome technologies, actually kind of add-ons, if you will, uh, almost done. <laughs> this is blinking right at me. Um, to, uh, to the existing technology, both on the computational side to uh, do a better job analyzing the sequencing output and to pre-treat the DNA to enrich for the line one signal uh, before we put it in the machine. Here's just one example in a patient uh, with schizophrenia where we uh, developed a machine learning uh, based uh, analysis pipeline of whole genome deep sequencing. Uh, it's the same locus from earlier, so this is a general schizophrenia locus, but just in this patient we can now detect there's actually a line one insertion kind of right in the middle of that locus and it's actually a central uh, genomic control region of that locus. Uh, and not only can we detect it now, we can also detect it uh, and we can show that it's only in the brain of this patient. If we had looked in uh, other tissue, for typically you look at blood DNA, right? We would not have found it. Um, and lastly, we can even, this is now becoming so sensitive, so we, we then sample DNA from ser several different anatomical locations of this brain, and we find it all over the brain, which is interesting, but actually only in each locus, only in about one to 3% of the brain cells. So it's a highly mosaic mutation, uh, and it's found both in uh, neurons and in glial cells, and we can now uh, start to detect these things. So I'll, I'll close here. Um, uh, this is the seven plus minute primer on psychiatric genetics and genomics. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, the, as Laura mentioned, I wanted to say a lot of this work is really uh, only possible, especially the more cutting edge, high uh, risk, high reward work, uh, thanks to phil philanthropy. Uh, the NIH is then actually, uh, you know, getting interested in these things, but it would not have been able, we would have been able to start this. Uh, and at the same time, it's interesting to learn here about which of these things may or may not be uh, moving into the realm of. Uh, 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 maybe impact investment. But anyways, uh, thanks to all of this. And th uh, thank you, and uh, enjoy your lunch. Thank you.